half of the Toronto Book Fair by proxy on Skype with a new sci-fi fantasy author, D. Wolfsbane of Ottawa. So it's nope. wonderful. Markham. Markham. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Maybe it was uh, me uh, being a little frazzled here. Pardon me. From Markham. Yes. So it's a, an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us today. And you have a debut novel called uh, The Ninth Scripture. Is that correct? Yes. The Hunt. The series is The Ninth Scripture. The first one is called The Hunt. Could you please tell us about your debut novel? Um, so the... The hunt starts at, on a planet called QS, where there's a world at war, um, where two nations have been fighting for as long as anyone can men remember. Um, the males are conscripted when they come of age to fight in the war, and the women are sent to nurturers to birth more soldiers to replace those they bury. Um, main character is Zakir. She's an orphan um, who's kind of given in to this fate, though she wishes she could find another way around it. And um, she... Um, ends up getting tested and found to have the talent, which is telekinesis, telepathy, all that cool stuff you wish you could do, um, and taken to a school to kind of learn and foster these abilities. Um, but it's not quite the salvation she thought it was at first amid sanctioned fights, um, discrimination, and then one desperate act kind of snowballs into another until everything kind of goes out of control, and she eventually finds a clue to her past that sends her on a journey. Okay, what were your inspirations for your debut novel? So there's a, I've always been a creator. I've always loved creating stories, games, um, kind of anything I really could at any moment. Um, so this story in particular, The Night Scripture, was the one story as a child that I kept coming back to because in my spare time, I'd play imaginary games and um, I'd go off and do a bunch of different things, uh, create a bunch of different characters. Um, and storylines and worlds. And this is the one I just come coming back to again and again and again. So I came back to it six different times, which created the six different parts that made up the three books that are going to be this trilogy um, when complete. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it began. Um, and it's kind of always been my love. That one story I really wanted to keep a record of um, because it was my childhood game. That was kind of my main one. What, what makes your de debut novel unique uh, for its genre? Um, there's a few different things. I think one of the main things is um, how it's organized and created. It's meant to be fast paced um, and to give the reader credit. So like I don't start with, let's say, an action scene like a lot of these ones tend to. It kind of builds into the world and creates a world that um, people can feel at home with and kind of escape into. Um, and the big thing with it is it's extremely dense because I find that I like novels that have a lot of world, a lot of characters, a lot of plot kind of built into it. And so I very much made it fast, um, dense, and very intricate because there's a lot of different moving pieces uh, that kind of come together and you can kind of pick and see them as you go through um, and hopefully piece them together. Um, but yeah, it's really with the fully realized world and it's a completely different world that no one has entered before. So a, a question to obtain your book then, who is your publisher and how would one go about purchasing your book? Uh, so you can find my book on Amazon.ca. Um, um, I ended up choosing to self-publish this book because I decided for this one in particular, for this story that was really close to my heart, I wanted it to be... Um, very true to itself, still developed, and because it's vastly different than what it once was, it's um, much better than it had been initially uh, through all the edits and such. Um, but I really wanted it to have a bit of an unusual structure because a lot of traditional publishers like their formula because that's what sells and works, but I really wanted to create something new and different um, and create a lot of plot twists that you wouldn't see coming and kind of build a new way. So you can find it on Amazon. Um, You and I spoke in our virtual green room earlier today, and we found out that we both share a passion for uh, tabletop gaming. 
And I, I'm, I'm very proud of that, by the way. So <laughs> I love it. Anytime I can play, I'll be there. Excellent, excellent. Although I must say, you came to the Dungeons and Dragons table a little late, but that's okay. You're well, you're you're just a child. That's all right. That's uh, what happens when you are bored when it first comes out. <laughs> Touche. So, can you talk to us a little bit about the process of world building? Because I get the impression that you're a world builder. You're not you're not just a, a novel, you're a world builder. So please talk to us about that. I think I built a bunch of different ones. And I think you really have to start with a premise of the people or something that you really want um, to explore with the world. Um, so for my novel, it was very much about the talent and how that would craft and create different cultures and uh, places and people um, in terms of D&D &D and other worlds. Um, so I play Dungeons and Dragons, which is one of the role playing games we had discussed earlier. And it's very much about um, having wizards in different um, races and such that kind of populate that. And so it's about how to um, bring those out in an interesting and unique way. Um, that kind of hasn't been seen before when I build those worlds. And so it really depends on what type of world I want to build um, and what I really want to get across with the world um, and what I really want to explore in it. So um, when you're world building, do you use any kind of mapping method? Do you use a, 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 a flip chart, virtual or real, to join ideas or timelines? You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Tolkien. And you look at the appendices. And I mean, there are thousands of years detailed there. I mean, it's just incredible. In Fifty years it took one man to, to 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 create this legendarium. So this is this is what I really love. Um, do you do something similar uh, to write out timelines and things? Yeah. So I initially started um, a long time ago, at least with my novel. Um, pen and paper with a bunch of different notebooks, and each notebook was kind of something different. Um, whether it was um, the different wars that might have happened before, whether it was different cultures and about their uh, customs um, and ways and celebrations and calendar, like all the different things that would make up a culture. Um, so I started with pen and paper and different notebooks, and then I kind of moved on to using different documents and kind of linking the documents together. Um, so I have a folder with like pages and pages. I probably... I have more pages probably written in background than I do in the first novel of like the different places and people and such. Um, and so they're kind of categorized and then you have like a main table that kind of can link me to all the others. So I know where to find everything because it's just so much because I like creating, yeah, a fully realized place is more than anyone can really keep in their head all at one time. So you have to be organized and have it all. So I tend to use um, more documents and such for that. And and what were the inspirations for your world, the, the backdrop of your debut novel? Um, so the there's a few different places in different cultures. Um, the one setting is very militarized um, and is very much about exploring um, kind of a mix of technologies within this within that world and kind of what it's becoming. And the culture is very geared towards um, the war and the fight. Um, in other places, the inspiration more comes from the elements and different settings. So um, each of the cultures and people there are based on, like you have a group that lives in the plains, a group that lives um, by the ocean, a group that lives in the forest and the mountains, and their cultures and everything have kind of been built on that, but there was an origin point. And so all of them have similar threads that kind of can lead through them and then they kind of have diverged over time and depending which one diverged first and second also creates how much further they are from the original type um and so yeah they have there's kind of this interconnectedness between them and it's almost very elemental or earth-based um and then there's kind of been divergences from that. But all of that one especially links back to this idea of the talent and how a society would be structured very differently than everyone has the ability. you then 
So the talent is a bunch of different things. It's an energy-based system because I'm a big fan of it not just being, well, you can do anything. No, there's an actual system by which this works. And that's where some of my background documents come from. Um, so it's an energy-based system where everyone has and anyone who has the talents essentially has this inherent ability to be able to move energy essentially because um, science energy is matter and matter is energy it's kind of interchangeable um yes the so, equivalency relationship of einstein yes yeah e equals mc squared and so there's kind of this um equivalency and so they're able to kind of take the take energies and use it in a way that um, we as humans right now can't. And so they're able to kind of tap into that and manipulate it. And so what does that mean in terms of their abilities? Well, they can use it to communicate, they can use it to move things, they can use it um, to kind of create barriers, they can use it in more condensed forms as projectiles. They, so they can use it in a bunch of different ways. Um, and through that, they can create society where you don't have the reliance on electricity and um, other types of technology that we've created because they're inherently able to do a lot of these things. And since you can kind of encode the message into this energy and have it almost, if you do it the right way, you can kind of have it work on its own um, in certain scenarios that allows them a lot more freedom in terms of what else they can do with their time. If you had to classify your work in a genre, would it be fantasy, science fantasy, uh, like Star Wars, for instance, or science fiction? Because you're now mentioning this ability to do things that kind of transcends technology and that technology shouldn't be redundant to that, right? So so what would you classify your work as? I tend to classify it under sci-fi fantasy because the fact there's a mix of the two. Mm. Um, it's kind of melded the two genres together within it because it also depends where you are, whether you're more in the technological um, sense and um, space travel type sense and then you have another version where it's very um, sword fighting elemental base using um, what kind of looks like magic to the outside but mm. has an energy kind of built into it so it's kind of a mixture of the two um, so I, don't, I can't really put it in one or the other it is both at the same time Okay. Who is your target audience and what would you like them to get from your work? So my target audience um, is young adults, so anywhere from teenagers up um, into the 20s, um, up to 30, and really it can be for anyone, because um, it is very clean, so you can keep it for um, some audiences, even older ones can bring it to that. I really want to, for them to, there's a bunch of different things, it depends what they take from it, because I think that's one of the beautiful things that I've realize when I've been getting feedback and reviews is everyone's kind of taken something different from it. And that's what I like about having it so dense and having it so intricate with all these different moving parts is some people took away the idea of gratitude from it. Some people took away, um, they just found it, it was a wonderful escape and they loved the world and wanted to be there. Um, some people um, ended up just really connecting to certain characters and taking kind of the love or some little timbits of wisdom or different things. And so, I want people to take away whatever is most meaningful to them, essentially, from it. Um, as long as they like it, enjoy it, take something positive from it, then I'm happy. What, uh, what fantasy and sci-fi worlds or universes or legends uh, are you a fan of? And, and um, what are the pros and cons in your mind uh, of those particular modalities? Um, so one of my favorites. I do really love Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> um, it's one of my favorites. Um, and uh, like like pre David Tennant or uh, or post or during or what? Um, well, <laughs> new Who essentially. So anyway, two thousand five to now. Um, okay. I tried watching some of the classics and they're they're good, but they've definitely dated a bit over time. So very much the New Who is where I've kind of stuck in. Um, I love about it is the amount that you can explore in that. Um, and I think it really shows from episode to episode is the fact that you can have so many different types of things happen because you have all of time and space to be able to play with, essentially. Um, and so you can do a historical episode and jump into like a horror episode and then jump into um, something that's more like a psychological thriller. And so I find that one's very interesting in the sense that you have, it's basically the largest sandbox you could possibly create to play in. 
Um, and then the other thing is the wonderful idea of having a main character who can regenerate, um, because then you can essentially go infinitely um, with this idea. Um, and so, and with that, they kind of build and grow and every doctor is different and everyone brings something different to the table. And so I like the changing aspect. I love how it evolves over time. It doesn't ever really stay stagnant. Um, and I love, yeah, all the different parts that kind of can come together and all the different things you can explore within such a world. Cool. Any other ones besides who? Oh. Whovian, you're a Whovian? <laughs> so many. I, I, I go a lot of the classics, like um, Lord of the Rings, I absolutely adore. Um, uh, they did those movies fantastically, <laughs> you can't complain with them. Um, yeah, I've watched all the classic type stuff, so that, Star Wars, Star Trek, um, and all the different worlds within that. Um, even Firefly, for those who stuck around for the Oh, yeah. Ten years. Absolutely, absolutely. Serenity was a fantastic movie. That was post-Firefly. Yeah, and then into, yeah, Serenity was good. Um, and then into um, different novels that um, I like, which was Harry Potter was kind of in my age group growing up. And so that was one of the ones we kind of hung to. The one of my favorite series is, was Pendra is Pendragon. Yes. Um, the, yeah, um, preteen series. And I absolutely love that one and all the differences. But again, it's just the variety of things that kind of come within the one series. Well, that's fascinating. Now, we spoke uh, earlier, and uh, I know a little bit about you. Could you please uh, inform our viewers a little bit about yourself? So what's your what's your educational background? What do you do as much or as little as you're comfortable divulging? Oh, by the way, D. Wolfsbane, is that a pseudonym? Yes. And and how did you choose that? Um, there's a bunch of different things to it. One of the ones was Wolfsbane is kind of um, a name I've written on different RP role playing forums and such that I've used in the past and kind of really felt like it was my writer's name when I started going into that. I'm very into, I love planting and gardening and things. And so Wolfsbane is an herb if people don't know. Um, yeah, doesn't it protect you from uh, lycanthropes or uh, something? <laughs> In those settings, yes. Yeah, poisonous. So. No, no, in real life, I've got some here around here somewhere, don't I, over there? Well, definitely, sorry. But, yeah, and so D is my initial, my original initial, and also I always kind of love the idea of having the initial DW. Because it's a bit of For Doctor Who, yeah. And Doctor, like, there's so many good DWs. <laughs> 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 um, so And uh, I know you played varsity hockey at a high level for, for, for uh, I mean, were you, were you a champion uh, hockey player? So I played hockey for a number of years at a high level. Um, I was a goalie and um, I played junior for three years and then played varsity for my last years at university. Um, we won silver. I don't know if you say that win or loss. <laughs> um, we ended up getting the um, silver in the OERAs for the two years that I was there and playing. And the second year, the my final year at university, um, we ended up, um, the first game in the finals was against Queens, and we ended up um, breaking the record for the longest game in men's or women's intercollegiate history. We were nine minutes shy of the NHL record. This what was game, that? It started at, um, well, it was 167 minutes of gameplay. Three hours, it, wow. Yeah, it started at 7.30 at night. We finished at 1 a.m. and we were all done. Wow. <laughs> After that. Yeah, yeah, especially as a goalie being in net uh, like that, uh, that, that's pretty hardcore. Yeah, we were six six overtimes and there were 20 minute overtimes after the first one and so i was like i don't even know what net i'm going to now mm. i just know that we're here yeah it was it was definitely um it was definitely a moment in the memory that does your sporting background inspire or inform any of your writing work i think yes and no like i don't really tend to, i guess i did actually kind of have this a few sporting moments within it at times but um, I think a lot of the stuff that I took from 
on my athletic background kind of finds its way in, both, both from like the triumphs and defeats um, through um, the politics that comes from high level sports, um, through a lot of the things I kind of learned about myself and about others um, through the process. So I think it comes out in small little ways, um, but it, it definitely, like I can think about different moments that I kind of have pulled from. There's this one where um, Zakir has is kind of in a sporting event, and a lot of the um, self-talk and different things that kind of happened within that was from my time as a goalie, essentially. And being a high school teacher, science, biology, and chemistry are your teachables. See, I remember. And does that inform your writing? And if so, how? Well, I think being in the sci-fi genre, you kind of have a little bit of a science background always to begin with, because mm. I think that's part of why we're attracted to that genre. It's okay, now we know some of this base science, how do I push that or what could actually be possible based on what you already know? And I find it fascinating, the different things that, if you look at the biological world, because my degree was wildlife biology okay. at university, and so when you look at the biological world, it's just so magnificent how everything works and how it's kind of very interconnected and very efficient in a lot of what it does. And then you think about, okay, well, how can that essentially be pushed or brought into um, the technological also setting? Um, and I find that's very interesting. And it's also where I love the creation of different animals and plant life and things like that um, within the world that I make because I'm like, well, this would make sense. This was kind of the base body type because um, we kind of have that as a vertebrate. Mm -hmm. um, as a mammal, there's kind of a base symmetry and body type. And the hox gene, yeah. the hox gene, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how would that kind of change and modify if it was a slightly different version? And what would that look like? And what other possibilities would come from there? So, I don't know, a bunch of different things when it comes to my science background. Cool. Now, being a high school teacher, I mean, you don't have a lot of time. I, I know what high school teachers do. I know the demands on their time, especially if you're involved in extracurriculars. I don't know how you find the time to write. But how do you inspire this creativity uh, in your students or in, in the school in which you teach? Um, so I know one way. I know one way I'll yeah. write. <laughs> One way is through my Dungeons and Dragons club that I run on Fridays after school. And right now I've got 13 students in this club and they love the, it gives them a place to unwind and to create fantastical stories. And cre basically it's cooperative storytelling, which is what I love about it. Um, and then other ways is within the classroom, um, I try to come up with, so there's a bunch of within your lesson, trying to come up with different ways that kind of get them to start asking the questions instead of you always giving the answers, which can become a tendency in a lot of times and places, but also um, creating different assignments that are unusual and unique. So I created this one using some stuff from NASA um, for the grade nine science, um, and it was um, for their space unit. And so it's basically them designing a shuttle to Mars and. Um, the different, um, how you would have to look at the cost and the energy and the mass that's kind of required and how will you actually um, create something that can fulfill your mission requirements, but then also um, keep it under budget, keep it so that it can actually fly there and make it there and land and do what it needs to do. So um, it's creating different things when I have time to essentially be creative and come up with interesting and unique projects that they can really then take and um, explore and use their build their critical thinking skills to come up um, and answer the questions that are being asked. So authors often write to depict flaws uh, in our present day world and how they would like to envision a more ideal society, a more ideal world. What would the ideal world be for D. Wolfsbane? I think one that very much connects with nature, um, which is why I have so much nature based within this um, story, because I think um, in a technological world and setting, we kind of become disconnected quite often um, from our roots. And so I think that's one of the big things. And I think another thing is trust and truth. Because um, in this day and age with so much that you're not sure about, so much that 
um, is false and just strat flat out lies sometimes. I think being able to have a world where it's very much about truth. And so this story that I've created is very much about truth versus perception and the idea that perception is never the truth, that when your way of viewing an event automatically changes what the event is because of your own biases, because of your own history. And so it really gets brought to the forefront in the later books how uh, perception has kind of um, motivated the different parties to do what they do. Um, but in terms of an ideal world, yeah, very much about truth, very much about getting back to nature basics. I love hiking and going outside. And so anytime that um, you can kind of be amongst that and kind of have a very simple um, connected life, essentially with that and, very, and a lot of community um, with people around and um, building that. So as an extension of my previous question, and maybe we can go into a little more detail, what do you think some of the pitfalls are of living in our current modern world? Um, so there's a few different things. I think social media and technology has been made to be addictive. Um, and even a lot of the creators who have created um, these platforms have said that. It was made to be addictive. It was made to have people want to. Um, sign in and get likes and post. And so um, we kind of fall into that trap because, well, it does give a dopamine hit. It does make oh, yeah. want to actually keep doing it. You end up getting that good feeling with it. And so we end up falling into that trap. But the issue becomes if you never learn to shut off your brain, um, it just keeps going and going and going. And this manifests as anxiety. And it's kind of a lot of the anxiety that we see in the world and that I also see in my students a lot of the time. And a lot of it is from social media presence, but also the fact that they never stop. If you, um, if people are given five minutes in a waiting room or somewhere else, what do people do? They pull up their phones and play a game or check their messages. And then your brain just keeps going and going. And without a break, it forgets how to take a break. Um, and so, to kind of combat that, that's where a lot of the mindfulness and meditations that a lot of people have started looking into and kind of trying to build into their lives have come from. It's because of this um, essentially anxiety induced by technology. That's, uh, yeah, you have a unique position as a teacher, certainly with all the uh, artificial dopamine hits that the students get, right? I mean, we've we're not living in an age where this was ever possible before. So, well, I have a question for you then. One of your young high school students comes up to you and says, Dungeon Master Wolfbane, can you please give me some advice on writing? I want to be a writer. Tell me what to do. Tell me, give me some advice. The, first of all, write what you love. Um, what is it that inspires you? What is it that, what story do you want to tell? What story attracts you and makes you want to put pen to paper um, and start there and just write because the only way to become better at doing anything is just by doing it um, again and again. So, um, and even if you don't think it's any good, even if you don't think um, you're going to get anywhere with it, do it because it's something you love to do because um, so often people forget that and then just kind of go about their lives without actually really living it. And so you want to write then just start writing what you love and then look for people who can help you make it better um look for what you can do to Now, your first book, your debut novel, The Ninth Scripture, The Hunt. What are the titles of the subsequent two books, and when can we expect to read them? Are they are they out already? I I, I uh, the, started doing my research and. Um. So the next book is called The Awakening. I'm going to keep the last book title for me right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery the <book> is yeah. <laughs> the Awakening is um being currently written. My um, goal is by kind of 2022 to have it finalized. Um, okay. um, so a bit of time, but um, yeah, so 
are the are the themes different in the sequel um, and in the no okay yes and no um yeah. so there are certain ones that carry through the whole thing so truth versus perception um definitely carries through but the very first one is very about very much about finding a home um and finding that place where you can belong um well they much have found that so now it's kind of the next step um of finding how you kind of work within that culture and how can I be me yet still belong, right? Um, and kind of finding yourself within a larger context. And so there's changes to um, the themes, but there's also a few that kind of run through um, the entire trilogy. Okay. And um, do you have a website? Is there a way to read about you, you and your work? Uh, yes. So my website is dwolfspain.com. Um, okay. so find it there um, it mostly has um, the blurb for the book you can sign up for my um, email list if you want to know about different topics whether it's just when another book comes out or whether it's um, for Dungeons and Dragons stuff or um, different events that I might be attending um, so there's a bunch of, there's a few different options for what people might be interested in you can also follow me on Twitter at, at D, D underscore Wolfsbane um, and that's kind of where I give a lot of my updates, um, post different things about what I'm interested in or what I'm, um, different things that I've been watching and um, thoughts and ideas, updates about writing and so forth. Are, you, are your students members of uh, your Twitter? Uh, no, I, I tell them I'm not going to tell them what my pen name is until they graduate. Okay. To oh, <laughs> okay, okay. I like it. I like it. All right. Yeah, yeah. A little bit of a mystery there. Um, okay, that's wonderful. Do you have any final words, any final message you would like to make? You've got the Skype here, and we're listening. Um, I think it's just that um, if people are interested in reading something that is fast-paced, that is dense, that is um, a fully realized world, and like just escaping within it, um, if, they, if they tend to find other things more slow, very predictable, and want something that's faster paced, unpredictable, um, then this might be a good story um, for you. And I hope that if you do pick it up, that um, I hope you enjoy it and that um, you take something positive from it and share it with the world. Because I'm all about trying to share the things that I love with others, which is why I decided to publish in the first place. Um, and so I hope. You keep sharing your truth and your life and um, keep spreading the love between all of us. Well, thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dee. And uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure uh, conducting this interview with you. And uh, I wish you all the best with your two future installments. Are you planning another series after that or a parallel series? I'm just I've curious. I've been coming up with different worlds and things that I also want to get to and write. So I have a whole other world that's building my head. I got a few one-offs that are in my head, so I will keep writing. So. Is it is it the same universe though? Different worlds, same uh, universe? Haven't decided. I to build a new universe and create some new stuff. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna. I, I'll probably come back to it at some point, but um, this is kind of yeah. So. I'm going to keep building and creating new things, kind of what fits for the day and age that I feel like. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. And all the best to you and your students. And I hope to meet you in person someday. Yes. And uh, it's unfortunate with what's going on right now, but uh, we're dealing with it as best as we can. So thank you for your patience and allowing the Skype interview. And uh, once again, uh, D. Wolfsbane new sci-fi fantasy author and we look forward to your future works in a creative process you're very welcome are you a writer are you seeking to self-publish high quality and mass marketable books would you like to avoid the typical low quality self-published book that generally sells less than 50 copies here are top 10 ways agora will make your book look like a potential bestseller AgoraPublishing.com services include number one, ISBN registration, two, cataloging in publication or CIP registration, number three, books in print basic for Canada and the US, number four, books in print international to get your book sold with online booksellers internationally. 
Number five, copy editing for basic grammar and typos. Number six, substantive editing for style revamping and other consulting. Number seven, typesetting, layout, and graphic design essential for that professional look. Number eight, book cover design. Number nine, book website and author blog design along with search engine optimization, often just called SEO, and also search engine marketing, otherwise known as SEM. 10, agorapublishing.com even provides book distribution, agency services, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to agorapublishing.com today and find out how they can make you a great selling author. That's agorapublishing.com. A-G-O-R-A-P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G.com. Thank you.